Welcome to the Artist Academy podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Earhart, and I am so excited that you're here to catch the weekly replay of my laid-back yet very inspiring conversations with other full-time professional artists. The purpose of this series is to show aspiring artists that it is completely possible to have a great career in the arts and if you ever want to tune in and have your questions answered in real time by myself or featured guests then just check out the schedule over at facebook.com slash groups slash artist academy every tuesday to catch us on live i'll see you there This episode is sponsored by the Artist Academy Advanced Membership, a program for artists who want to up-level their art game by taking it from a hobby or a side hustle to a full-time six-figure art business. With weekly trainings that include step-by-step proven art business techniques, plus painting tutorials from yours truly (laughs) and other guest artists who are masters in their field, you will be well-equipped to learn and grow into the highly skilled and highly profitable artist you know you're meant to be. I've figured out what it takes to build my own six-figure art business, and now my heart is set on teaching aspiring artists like you to do the same. It's not hard, but it does require your time and dedication. So if you're up for the challenge, go to advancedmember.com. That's advancedmember.com to learn more. This week's episode features New Mexico-based sculptor Jeffrey Gorman. Jeffrey applied to be on the podcast a few weeks ago, and as I was checking out his Instagram to see if he would be a good fit, I was thinking... This guy looks really interesting. I saw that he was teaching all over North America and creating a very different style of art than I'm used to, and all of that totally, completely piqued my interest. This guy has worn many hats within the art world, from a curator to a teacher, working with galleries and freelancing, and he travels for a few months out of the year. So you can see why I was so glad he applied to be on the podcast. And with that, I just want to mention that if you think you would be a good fit to be interviewed by me live, you can go to artistacademypodcast.com to nominate yourself or your favorite artist to be a guest. The only qualification is that every guest must be a full-time working artist because, as you know, the purpose of this series is to show aspiring artists like you that it is completely possible to have an amazing career in the arts, and I think this week's guest is an amazing example of just that. So let me know what you think about this episode with Jeffrey Gorman. Can you just kind of introduce yourself to anybody who might not know who you are just yet and just kind of give us a little background about how you got into art and what you currently do? Sure. So my name is Jeffrey Gorman. I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I've lived here for about 40 years and I've had a varied career. It's been almost um, all of my adult life I've been in the arts. I went to art school many years ago. I went to a couple of different art schools studying photography Then I moved to New Mexico, and at that time, I became a furniture maker. So I I made custom furniture for a while. And then I got out of that and uh, was kind of trying to figure out what next to do. Knowing that I've been an artist basically my whole life, um, I started working for galleries. And I worked for a big contemporary gallery in Santa Fe for quite a few years. It was the biggest contemporary gallery traveled all around the world in that job. I was the assistant director then. Then I was the director of the gallery then. When I moved on from there, I started working with artists' estates. So I worked with a couple of prominent artists based out of Santa Fe, traveled to Europe to set up museum shows, um, got out of that, and then I became an art consultant. I've been an arts curator. I've been an arts writer. I, I was a uh, life coach for artists for quite a while. I taught seminars around the United States on the business of art. This kind of goes on and on. <laughs> but you asked. Yeah, um, I'm interested. And, uh, I, um, and, then, and then to make a long story even longer, no, shorter. Um, about 15 years ago, I was coaching a group of about um, 80 artists in Santa Fe. And 
we would have these weekly meetings and we decided I was working with a college here to put a show together based in, it was St. John's College, based on the great books. So we selected four of the books and then we asked these artists to do an artwork based on one of the four books. And I hadn't done any artwork in about 30 years and I had been a photographer. For the heck of it, I decided to make a sculpture. I read The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. I made this sculpture of, of, of Huck floating down the river uh, for this show. First thing I'd done in a long, long time. And for some reason, it just kind of opened the floodgates. I started working with found and recycled material. It was very serendipitous because that's what was in my backyard. Um, it's been 15 years since I did that. And luckily, about 12 of it, I have been making a living at this. Um, if you look at my work, you'll realize that it is pretty unique. There aren't a lot of people that are doing exactly what I'm doing. And it's been quite an adventure. That's amazing. That's that's so awesome. You've been, I think you've worn almost every hat that you can in the art world. That's... I, I have. And it's been pretty fascinating because now being a practicing artist, it's a very, very different perspective. Um, you know, I taught at a couple of colleges uh, around here and I taught workshops around the United States, consulting artists on how to get the business together. Since I've become a practicing artist, I think one of the people often ask me my very first piece of advice, which is not sometimes what people want to hear is, um, you know, the artist, first of all, you have to be at the table to figure out what your career moves are going to be. Second of all, you got to use your elbows. And when I used to consult artists, I used to maybe um, not be as uh, pushing them to be as persistent as I realized being an artist. Now you really, really have to be. So it's, that was one of the very first things I realized when I became an artist, you know, the, the, from coaching artists to being a practicing artist are two very, very different things. Yeah, definitely. For sure. So w when you mean being persistent, um, I think a, a lot of people who are l listening to the podcast or live with us, um, they're like, yeah, like I, I know I need to be, but it's so like, everybody's so like introverted really. And so I know, I know. <laughs> and Andrea, you know, um, and I don't want to lecture you, yeah. but, uh, because I've, I've spent a lot of time on this. There's some myths that I think us artists carry around with us. One myth is that somebody else might make our art career like a gallery dealer or an arts agent or a partner or, uh, whatever. That's a myth. Um, another one is, is that we can afford to have somebody else speak for us. That's a myth. We can't. And, um, I, I think that about 98% of us are actually more extroverted than we realize. I think there are, there is a percentage that's really, really introverted and can't do this. But um, bottom line for me is uh, probably the biggest motivator I've had here is if I don't succeed at this, what am I going to do next? And uh, uh, the only thing I came up with was become a realtor. And so I'm pretty motivated, you know, to make a living at being an artist. So that's amazing. That, that, that's great. That's also one of my motivations as well, because like, I'm like, okay, if I can't make this work, there's nothing else that even like sounds really yeah. fun. So. Yeah. I mean, I know I can't work with people. I've become so wild now and so untamed that <laughs> when I'm in big groups of people, I'm just a troublemaker. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That, that that's amazing and i think you're so right with the whole like there are certain there's a, there's a small percentage of people you know who are like extremely introverted and like it's so hard for them to like talk to people but for the majority of us it's not that hard we're just kind of yeah. making up stories in our head so i love that you exactly that. and andrea you know i would say to you or anybody else who is the number one expert in the world about your work and your life and your career and your passion and your thoughts who's the number one yeah Exactly. It's you. Yeah. <laughs> it's you. So why are you handing the reins to somebody else? Yeah. Now, I have to tell you, when I started getting into this, I went, amazingly enough, to Dale Carnegie. I did this thing called um, Toastmasters because oh. I was really shy. And I knew that if I got into this, that I would have to be my own spokesperson. So I did some training to become more of a, a, of a comfortable in a, in a public setting. That, that's amazing. And I love that you said that, too, that it didn't really come naturally, but you're you're at that point. How long were you in Toastmasters? Oh, I think I was in it for two years. And the great thing about Toastmasters is they uh, first of all, you're terrified in the beginning, just terrified. And then you realize that it's really fun. And then it's a terrific way of communication. 
Um, and they give you all these funny little um, challenges to do, like a five minute talk and a 10 minute talk. And then there's subjects you have to come up with. And it becomes really fun um, to learn how to present yourself effectively to people. That's awesome. So I, I've actually gone to one Toastmasters meeting uh, about a couple months ago before this all started, uh, the whole like quarantine thing started. And yeah, the first time I was like, ooh, this is scary. <laughs> I don't yeah. know about this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, a funny story, when I went to Dale Carnegie, which was kind of a big deal, um, I, I went down there. I was terrified. I yeah. was terrified. And there were about 30 people there. And I looked around and I realized in looking at all the people that the person that probably had the least problems with communicating was me. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a very odd kind of realization. I mean, people really, really struggle about presenting themselves. And we know as artists, it's all about our story. It's about our passion. It's about our vision. It's about our influence, whatever it is. I mean, basically what we are is we're, we're visual storytellers. Yeah, so true. Well, you've inspired me to definitely go back after they they start to yeah. have more meetings because yeah, I was like, man, like that's this is tough. I'm like, will yeah. it will it ever get easy? Like, yeah, and, no, it does, it does, okay. and then you win those little silly awards and you're all proud of them. And uh, uh, life is a life is a trip, no uh, question about it. Okay, okay, good, okay. And for for anybody that's uh, that needs more information on Toastmasters who's listening, I'm pretty sure you can go to, you can search like Toastmasters in your hometown and every exactly. town has like a small meetup of people. I think mine had like 20 years, had like 30 and yeah. like every major city has a meetup of people and you go there and you present and just, so just to kind of give them like a, a background of it. And it really helps with public speaking, which is why I'm going there. Cause I get asked to speak yeah. um, to like, I don't know, like schools and groups and stuff and like that just it makes me sweat thinking about it yeah. i want to yeah. just get yeah. over it yeah yeah no i've had a long history of failure when it came to pu public speaking so <laughs> um it was uh, quite a challenge for me oh good well and and you got over it and just really that's so inspiring just like hearing that you're you're on the other side of it and i think there's just so many things that can open up in your brain too once you're comfortable with speaking in front of a group you know? Yeah. And Andrea, you know, one um, one little kind of um, example I that I use with artists to get them going is I don't know. Um, I use this introductory sentence where uh, it's an exercise I used to do with artists where if I ask you, I meet you somewhere at an opening. What do you do? I want you in one sentence to tell me what you do and what your passions are. That's good. And most artists, when you try to do that with them, they can't. Yeah, but there are steps along. So it's really fun to kind of, you know, there are tools to use to get us to be better communicators. So true. So true. Yeah, it's um, I, I, I tell my students that it's like the 15 second pitch. It's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You, yeah, you, you should be able to summarize what you do in 15 yeah. seconds. So if you you only have time exactly. to, to say. That. Yeah. Um, and then you can put it on a business card. You can put it on your website. It can become your slogan. It can. So everything has another use. Yes. And I came up with this little slangy thing for my, I, I say old sticks, new ideas okay. is kind of the slogan for what I do. Okay. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Okay. So next question, what is your typical work day? How many hours do you spend creating? Well, I mean, looking at the big picture over the last couple of years, I've been really lucky in terms of income. Um, I have two passions in life. One is um, travel and the other is making art. So what I do now is I do intensive travel probably three months out of the year. And then I come back and I work really intensely. So I'll work through, I kind of work full time when I'm home. And um, my days are probably probably from four to six hours a day. I find that um, having done it for a while now, there's a period where I'm pretty productive. And then and then sometimes, you know, sometimes I can get more done in an hour than I can in a day. So that's roughly um, my schedule every day. Awesome. I, I love that you said that because I am the same way. You know, I'll, I'll take off a, a month here, a, a month there. But then when I'm home, it's work time. So w right. w where do you travel? Well, gosh, you know, after the last couple of years, I've been so darn lucky. So I was thinking the other night um, in the last three years, I have been to Scotland. I um, hiked the Inca Trail. 
I've been to Jordan and Petra. I've been to Egypt. Um, and I uh, just came back from Croatia and Montenegro. And then I go down to Mexico quite a bit. That's amazing. I yeah, love that. I've been very lucky. Very lucky. Yes. Um, that's so, I mean, and we could talk about travel all day. That's my yeah, thing. <laughs> it looks like you've done quite a bit of traveling yourself. I've been very impressed with some of the places you've been to. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we, um, we just did Antarctica for our honeymoon. So. I, I saw that. That looked gorgeous. I would die to see those penguins. Yes, it was so cool. <laughs> I mean, I totally live in an animal world, you know. I mean, Same. everything, my, my, my work is all about animals, and animals are kind of my world that I live in. So when I travel, it's about animals. That's amazing. We are so alike. I'm so I'm so glad that I get to virtually meet you. <laughs> this is fun. Yeah, for sure. Okay, um, so can you talk us through your creating process? Are there any methods or techniques that you've picked up through the years? I, I know that you take kind of um, found objects. Yeah, I do. And, you know, I was a furniture maker for about, I, I don't know how many years. Um, I went to a furniture making, uh, I, I did a mentorship with a pretty well-known furniture maker in Vermont when I was 24. And um, so a lot of my techniques are furniture based. They're cabinetry, furniture, sculptural furniture based. But I often refer to my work as as myself being a recovering furniture maker because furniture makers are very tight, very anal, very precise. If you look like I have a little bird here that I made out of bike tires and tin cans and wire and this is not really precise. This is not great joinery. But um (laughs) A lot of the techniques that I learned are from being a furniture maker. Um, and uh, um, so that's so I, I know how to use basic tools. I know how to use a bandsaw. I know how to use a sander. I know how to use um, basic carpentry tools. I do a little bit of welding, too, which is really fun. I have this little tiny welder that I got from Harbor Freight, which is quite fun. Um, so my techniques are... Um, uh, they're made up. I don't know anybody, you know, approaching it the way I use a lot of wire. Wire is probably my main kind of medium in a way. Like, it, obviously, if you're a painter, if you're a drawer, your pencil is maybe um, your main medium. Wire is what I use to draw with, basically. It, so a lot of my work has wire in it. Um, and I can't remember the rest of your question. Oh, no, you're good. It, it basically, um, are there any methods or techniques you've picked up through the years? Like, oh, has, okay. So how, has it always been like that, like like very loose and very wire and all of that? Or has Yeah, it yeah. The very first pieces I did were figurative. And basically um, what I did was I – and I'm trying to think I could show you a piece here. The very first piece I ever made, um, I just wired these sticks together. They were stick figures. And I had this wire and these um, sticks in my backyard, and it was for this show, for this show at this uh, college. And I, you know, being a gallery dealer for a while, I got very frustrated with high-end artists that had to have the perfect studio, had to have the perfect arrangements, had to have um, everything just perfect. And always in my mind, I said, you know, you can make something from anything if you're determined enough. So that was the test to me. My premise was, could I make something? So I literally went in my backyard, found some sticks some wires, some rags, started wrapping these things together. And that's how I started with all of this. It was not really thought out. Um, and then this kind of whole vocabulary developed from there. Very interesting. So what is your, what, what is your, your go-to thing to sculpt and make? Like, um... Um, you mean imagery or material? Um, both. Both. Um, You know, I I think of my art as journaling. I think of what I'm doing is I'm taking my daily experience of living in my life and what I know to date, and I'm turning it into something physical. So, So that's when I made this guy. So that's so this is one of those ravens kind of talking to me. So um, my experiences are what I translate in. Um, I spend a lot of time. I have a beautiful bird feeder out here. I spend a lot of time looking at the birds. So I do a lot of small songbirds. So the interaction of animals around me is often what influences what I make. Now, the other side of it is sometimes the material I have will influence what I make. In other words, um, uh, bike tires i use a lot of tires and a lot of inner tubes and when when i first started working with them you know i i thought what's black obviously a raven is black right 
So I started making these ravens. Now, what this is, and this is a go-to. I build a lot of ravens, a lot of and a lot of birds. Um, this is foam, taxidermy foam, that um, I've glued a wooden beak to, and then I've wrapped it with bicycle tires. Oh my god! So that becomes that becomes the base, kind of the armature for everything else that I'm going to add to the piece. So I do a lot of birds. I do a lot of dogs. I do a lot of rabbits. Um, I also do wings. So I'm, I'm starting to fabricate these cicada wings. You can see that I fabricated a, um, a, a, um, a metal armature to attach the wings to. So I do a lot of wings. Um, I also do some bronzes. I've started making bronzes. Um, this is a bronze rabbit that, um, that I, so, so the, the rabbit is cast and then I hand finish them and then I fabricated a base for him. Um, <laughs> So it's just about all animals now. I'm not doing a lot of figurative work anymore. Yeah, very cool. I like it. Yeah, I, I'm very much drawn to animals over figures, like, so much more. Um, uh-huh. So who are your buyers? Like, where do you where do you sell this stuff? Where do you... Well, you know, I've been lucky. Um, I've had a... Um, I've been to a bunch of art fairs around, literally around the world. I had a show in Beijing, China at an art fair and uh with a couple of there i've worked with a couple of really good dealers unfortunately they've all gone out of business i worked with one woman jane sauer who was very well known from st louis and i worked with her for about five years and jane um kind of tucked me under her wing and brought me around the world and really believed in my work and introduced me to a lot of collectors a lot of museums a lot of art consultants and that was about 10 years ago um that I worked with Jane. So Jane introduced me to this whole level of collectors then um, who I've kept up with. Now, the other thing that I do is I also teach workshops around the United States and in Mexico. And I also have picked up clients from, from the United States and Mexico. Um, And then Facebook has been really good for clients. I um, it's a great way to stay in touch with my clients. And I get quite a bit of response on Facebook. Um, to create i do a lot of commissions for my clients and then um i have galleries around the united states that are great to work with um they bring me some clients i have a great gallery now in santa fe called jacoby fritz and uh uh so through the years i've managed to build up this client base it's been about 15 years yeah amazing (laughs) yeah so would you say your clients are mostly like personal collectors or like do they get your stuff for their businesses or, you know, it's, it's funny. It's been a little bit of both. Um, I have a collector down, down in, um, I I think he's in Texas. And I just realized the other day, you know, sometimes being an artist, you feel like Rip Van Winkle, suddenly something appears and you're like, where was I for the last? And I think he's a, um, a, a medical marijuana distributor. And, um, he tells me about that. He puts it in my work in all of his offices which I find very work- <laughs> funny because my work's a little trippy to begin with. Oh. Um, I, I, I have worked with some art consultants around the United States. I have a terrific art consultant that has placed my work in, for, for Delta Airlines in Atlanta and in Dallas in their, um, their, room, their um, you know, hospitality rooms. So, and then I have a lot of private collectors, which is really fun too. Awesome. And, and I'm lucky. I don't know about you, but collectors sometimes will call me and they'll say i i want a dog and i'm like well what kind of dog and they're like whatever you want to do (laughs) and i've been very lucky i mean people like my work and i think i've had like a hundred percent return you know um satisfaction i my yelp ratings are very high oh okay Uh, no i'm kidding that's a joke (laughs) that's a joke uh so i have a real mix of clients oh that's that's awesome. Like, and I just that's that's so cool to hear because I know nothing about the sculpture world. You know, it's a little different than the painting world. Um, How so? It's a little well. I think it's a little tougher because a lot of people, quote unquote, don't collect sculpture. They don't mm-hmm. collect three D objects. Yeah. And um, uh, I think that's why I've tried to make my work as compelling and personal and honest as I could to really obviously get that connection with my clients uh you know my work is pretty unique so 
in um, working with galleries and having done art, uh, quite a few art fairs, I think I've done 12 art fairs around the world. Um, people tell you exactly what they think at art fairs. <laughs> Nobody cares to tell you that they hate it or they love it. Or So you get this amazing feedback to see how you, people connect with your work. So that's been very helpful. Very nice. Okay. So you mentioned that you've done a couple art fairs and shows in Beijing and just kind of all around the world. Where's your, yeah. where's your favorite place to do an art show? And how, oh. do, how do you get everything there? Like your stuff is bigger. Well, and, and, and to clarify about the art shows, this is not where the artist is doing the art fair. It's where the dealer is bringing your work. I, I don't really do the art fairs where the artist brings the work. The dealers bring the work. So let's just say in Beijing, China, when we did when I did that art fair with Jane Sauer, um, she we had to crate it all up. It was very expensive to ship it over there. I think it was... Uh, Fifteen thousand dollars just to ship the artwork over there. Yeah, wow. yeah. Now I've done quite a few f- fairs in Chicago. The fairs are called Sofa. It's sculptural art, and they're um, what some people might call craft. Um, I've probably done quite a few Sofa, and we would drive a truck from Santa Fe with the artwork in it. And as you know, Andrea, shipping now is really expensive. So um, these art fairs are, I, I don't know if they're as busy, uh, certainly through what we're going through right now, they're closed down. Yeah. But it's a great way to meet your client base. Very interesting. I, I'm just soaking all of this in. I think it's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there something you don't like to paint without or create without? Um, yeah, that's a, I, I like that question because, yeah, you know, Every one of us has our own kind of vocabulary and our own Bible in a way and our own do's and don'ts. And most people never know what you will and you won't do in your. So what I won't do is I will not use any animal parts. I won't use feathers. I won't use leather. I won't use bones. I won't use um, anything that has had a past life because I feel like it's kind of sacrilegious um, to the animal. I mean, animals are very precious to me. You know, I, I mean, it's kind of almost this spiritual thing with me when I'm around animals. It really trends. My mind really goes into different places. Now, in thinking about that, I am selling this work. I'm making a living at it. And I don't want to take an animal part and make up money off of it. I feel like that's disrespectful to the animals. So one of my challenges in doing my work is I want you to think maybe it was a bone or maybe it was a feather or maybe it was a part of an animal when in fact it's a bike tire or it's a piece of tin or it's a, um, uh, something that... So my art is about transformation. I want to take one thing, an old bicycle tire, and I want to transform it into you thinking it's a bird wing or a butterfly wing. And I think our lives are about transformation. I think we're constantly transforming. I think we fight it. Luckily, us creative types get to go with the transformation that we're dealing with. We're very lucky in that sense. So that's probably the one thing I don't work with. That's amazing. I, I would not have even thought that as well. Yeah, yeah. And, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I, I think we are, we're, we're definitely one with our creatives. I think a lot of people fight it because we want to make money. And so we're like, we'll do this, we'll do that. And, but like listening to our inner creative and just kind of going with it, as you were mentioning, yeah. is just a key vital process. And I think you're a great example of that. You're just kind of going with it. You're like, I like this, yeah. I'm going to do it. Yeah, yeah I'm going, it, it, as I say, it's coming back to that journaling in a way. I'm trying to just be very direct about what I'm doing and I'm trying not to overthink what I do. I'm trying, and sometimes I'm trying to set up challenges for myself so I may not have the right material in my studio, but I'm going to make what I have in my studio work for what I'm putting together. So sometimes it becomes technical challenges for me as to how to craft something, yeah. which is fun. Yeah, it's, it's all fun. <laughs> yeah. Are there any art lessons you've learned the hard way? Oh, the hard way. Um, <laughs> life, um, uh, the hard way, you know, for me now, I, art lessons, the hardest lessons for me is with people okay. is, is my interactions with people. Those are the lessons that are the most challenging for me now, because, um, you know, and many of, of your viewers out there know, we spend so many hours a day in our head and we're mulling over things. And we're thinking about what we're doing. And obviously, we're very proud of ourselves and we're very pleased with what we've done. And there's a real, we're lucky that we can create our world with our hands. But sometimes it can get a little overblown. 
And sometimes I can feel that I'm more important than I really am. And sometimes I can feel I don't get the respect I deserve. <laughs> and so it's this weird kind of push and pull. And then when you go out to, you know, into the public. And so those are lessons, I guess. My biggest challenges are my relationships with people in the art world. So those are my challenges. Yeah, I can definitely relate. I think everybody can relate to that as well. We're all just kind of like hanging out in our studio in our head. Like, sh- should I do this? Should I do that? I don't know. What, what are people going to think of that? Will people like that more? Like, it's just. It's just a yeah. And you've got to get and that in a way you've got to get this tough skin. And in a way that was like at the beginning of the program when you said to me or I said to you, what have I learned? I've learned that we've got to be at the table and then we've got to use our elbows and we've got to be tough about Um, Because we're literally putting ourselves out there for anybody to say the good, the bad and the ugly. Anybody. I mean, we're just putting ourselves out there. And boy, the stuff I've heard recently on Facebook, um, I'm I'm doing this video journal now. I got a woman that emailed me on Facebook and and I was talking about how can we stay in touch during these times. And she said to me, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm like. (laughs) Okay, okay. You don't get it. You don't that's fine. I'm glad you told me. Yeah. I said I'm just trying to communicate. So, you know, you can't kind of take it personally. Yeah, for a for, lot of this. For sure. And I was listening to I can't remember who it was, some kind of influencer and he mentioned he was like, "Yeah, I don't I don't feed off of negative feedback." He's like, "But at the same time, you can't feed off positive feedback too much either." Yeah. Because yeah. Because yeah. if you're looking for all those likes and you don't get it, that's almost feeding off of the, the uh, the opposite side of the positive as well. And it's yeah. just like, he's like, you just got to like do it because you love it. If people like it, great. But like, don't weigh too much on how many likes or shares or comments you get on something on like for feedback. Yeah. And that's, I think that's a good point. That's the danger of social media because yeah. it's so one-sided. Um, you know, what I would recommend for people that are getting going in this um, is to, if possible, have one, two, three friends that have a really good eye, that they really trust, that not, and it's not necessarily family, because family is often going to tell you what they want to hear. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be an artist necessarily, but somebody that can come in and critique your work and give you a really honest perspective on it that you admire. And um, I, I still have people around me like that now that I really admire what they say. So I get some of those people to still, and I've been at it for 15 years now, to critique my work. Because sometimes I'm doing this work, I have no idea whether I'm really communicating what I'm trying to do or my work is effective. So I think it's really nice to have um, almost like a a team behind you that can come in and look at your work and go, um, what did you mean by this? Or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Good. I love all of that. (laughs) Uh, Do you have a favorite past project? Um, I have kind of a favorite macabre past project. It's kind of, well, um, it's, uh, you know what? um, And it's probably not appropriate for right now. Um, I did do a large deer, a very large deer. And um, he was in our, our community uh, gallery here in our community center for about five years This vi- with very large horns and he, he was just such a noble, beautiful animal and people would come by and he'd really speak to them about nature and about the beauty of animals and about um, and he's probably been my most um, uh, successful piece that I've done that I feel really good about and he's the largest piece that I've done to date uh, so I was very proud of him. Yeah, amazing. Okay, um, how how big is he? You said life size, life size. M- a, a very large deer um, with a huge huge antlers on him that I made out of scrap wood. And uh, um, there's another piece I did which is kind of fun. It's two dogs and they're running. And you know everything is a self portrait to me. They're about myself and my friend when we went to India and we went trekking in the Himalayas. And and the one dog who's kind of behind, kind of looking all tired and weak, is me. And then my friend was like this, you know, runner, and he's super fit. He's all in the front. He's kind of like, let's get going. And it's these two dogs on this path. And I, whenever I see that, I get a kind of a chuckle out of that. The state of New Mexico Arts Department bought that for their collection. So. Um, it's got a good home. Oh, 
that's amazing. And like, and where is the deer? Is it the same place? Um, the deer is. Um, uh, uh, he moved on, and he's in somebody's collection now. Awesome. <laughs> he's safe. <laughs> yes, he is. So, what are your future art plans and goals? Are you? What are you working on right now? What's What are you excited about this year? Well. <laughs> this year, um, we know that there are a lot of challenges out there. I think my challenges, I, I don't have any big, huge challenge uh, plans right now, right at today. They change all the time. I'm doing a video blog and I'm trying to um, really connect with people. And so I'm putting a lot of energy into that. Um, I'm trying to basically do what comes to me. So I'm doing songbirds. I'm doing a lot of animals that I'm seeing along the path. For some reason, the other day, a ground squirrel started living in my back shed. So I'll be doing a ground squirrel soon. Um, so I don't have a lot of long range plans. I want to come into my studio every day and I want to feel pretty fresh about it. And it's funny how with all the craziness out there, I come into the studio and I start working with my hands and start looking and it really calms me down and it really grounds me. And it uh i'm very lucky to have that we all are all of us creative types that we can go into this world that we've created so no huge plans right now and certainly all my travel plans got canceled i was supposed to be in vietnam right now oh really so yeah oh. yeah and i would have gotten back last wednesday and uh uh luckily i canceled that about two months ago when when things didn't start looking good yeah so well, hopefully you can So go no back. great big plans right now. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So uh, is there, oh, that's my last question on here, then we can let okay. you go. Is there any advice that you would give artists who want to make art their full-time career, but just don't know where to start? People just kind of are just hanging out and they're like, I don't even know what the first step is. What's the, yeah. what's the first step? Um, you know, I've taught classes and I've taught a lot of, so that's a huge, huge question. Um, I think the very first thing is to be able to create a consistent body of work. If you, you, I heard you say, if you want to make a living at it, correct? Yeah. yeah. If you want to sell it, if you want to sell the work, it has to be a consistent body of work. And it has to be, um, you know, Georgia O'Keeffe said that successful artists at least have two exhibitions ready to go in their studio at any time. And I think what she meant was when opportunity, you know, arises, you can jump on it. So think about that. I mean, a lot of artists that I've consulted don't have the work yet to become a professional. Yeah. They um, And when I was a gallery dealer, artists would come in with portfolios and I'd say, that's great. I'd like to see it after you've complete a hundred of them. Oh. And so that would weed out about 90% of the artists that I saw because, you know, when you're getting going, everything can appear to be a little precious and a little great. And your family's telling you, you really need to become professional. Well, do a hundred of those. Um, so it's tough out there. I can't say anything otherwise. It's a it's a tough, tough business. Now, there are a lot of very accomplished artists out there, as you've seen. Very, very. Um, I mean, look at Instagram. Look at any of these you're seeing. So number one is to really work on your vision, on your style, on what you're doing, and really be come up with a unique voice that you feel is compelling. Because in selling art there, you know, there's a compelling quality to it. That because it's this give and take between the client and the artist. So that's number one, I would say. Awesome. And I think it's a big one. I, I do as well. Yeah, I, think, I yeah. think you're spot on. When I was in college, one of my professors was like, you need to create every day and you need to just paint as much as you can. Just, uh, yeah. just over. Paint, 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 yeah. paint, 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 paint. paint paint doesn't yeah. matter whether it's good or bad or in between yeah and that, that that's basically what you're saying just like get it out like you know and in that process too you're going to discover who you are as an artist exactly exactly yeah yeah you are um sometimes some of the artists that used to consult with me would um kind of be all over the place i mean they'd have these different styles they'd be using these different techniques um in the gallery world they're not really looking for people that are multi-talented necessarily they're looking for a vision that they can market and that they can kind of brand you with yeah so so true yeah and i, I yeah. feel like you know for the past like five or so years i've kind of been all over the place too and so when i come to create like a body of work, I'm like, okay, what do I really like? like even I have, I have to just think about it. Yeah. And just well, I like, do too. I do yeah. too. I, I mean, you know how we are, us creative types, we're all over the place. Yeah. I mean, come on, <laughs> we're taking everything in. No, it's a challenge. 
Yeah. Definitely. It definitely is. But we're all in it together and we're doing it. We're in it together. Yeah, we are. (laughs) Awesome. Okay. Well, that is all I have. Thank you so much. I'm so glad I got to meet you. I've enjoyed this. You're just a light to start my day. And this this has been so fun. (laughs) Thank you. Take care and stay healthy. Uh, Yeah, you too. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye-bye. This episode is sponsored by the Artist Academy Advanced membership a program for artists who want to up level their art game by taking it from a hobby or a side hustle to a full-time six-figure art business with weekly trainings that include step-by-step proven art business techniques plus painting tutorials from yours truly and other guest artists who are masters in their field you will be well equipped to learn and grow into the highly skilled and highly profitable artist you know you're meant to be. I've figured out what it takes to build my own six-figure art business, and now my heart is set on teaching aspiring artists like you to do the same. It's not hard, but it does require your time and dedication. So if you're up for the challenge, go to advancedmember.com. That's advancedmember.com to learn more. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. If you review our podcast and send a screenshot of that review to me on Instagram, I am at art by Andrea Earhart. I will then promote your art on my story and tag you as a little thank you for helping me grow this podcast and our Artist Academy community. I have a reach of over 50,000 on Instagram. So this is a little help me to help you incentive. Also, if you ever want your questions answered in real time by myself or featured guests, then just hop on over to facebook.com slash groups slash Artist Academy to check out the schedule every Tuesday to catch us on live. I'll see you next week.